Hey class, I hope everyone's doing well today. Um, thank you for your flexibility in uh, kind of meeting online this week. Uh, we had um, something come up with church this week and um, that had to be at and attend. So um, we're going to be walking through the book of Isaiah this morning and um, just be looking through um, you know, a lot of the similar things, authorship, composition, themes, uh, things such as that. So today we're going to focus on Isaiah, uh, and don't forget there will be a discussion board for you to post to that will help track attendance and um, take care of any other you know, issues, class engagement, those kinds of things. Um, that's how we'll take care of that is through the um, uh, discussion post. So also don't forget these notes are online. They're on the info tab on Populi on our class section. And uh, you can download these and find all the commentary that goes along with it. So, in looking at the book of Isaiah, um, one thing that you'll see is this notion or this idea that Jehovah is salvation. So, you're going to see in this book uh, that salvation comes from the Lord. We're going to uh, see some eschatological events at the end. We're going to see... Um, you know, the descriptions of the suffering servant. We're going to see the prediction of uh, the future Messiah. Um, we're going to see um, the, the Lord high and lifted up uh, in the temple in Isaiah 6. So uh, this is a, a beautiful book, a wonderful book. Um, I highly encourage you to just spend as much time setting aside time just to read the book, just to... Uh, Grab your Bible, a cup of coffee, find a recliner, or you know wherever you're comfortable, and just read and uh, meditate and just let it soak in and uh, be refreshed uh, in the Lord and His Word and the fact that uh, in Him is salvation. So, in looking at this book, in many ways, Isaiah could be viewed as a miniature Bible. So there are 66 chapters. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, um, and interestingly enough, there are 66 books of the Bible. <laughs> um, the chapters uh, leading up to 39, to chapter 39, correspond with the Old Testament, discussing Israel uh, before the Messiah. Uh, but then the last 27 chapters correspond with the New Testament, speak about the Messiah uh, along with his coming kingdom. It's one of the most quoted New Testament, uh, uh, one of the most quoted Old Testament books found in the New Testament, about 400 quotations or allusions. So in the New Testament, you're going to find about 400 quotations or allusions. Um, some of those you know, are familiar to us um, and uh, others not. <laughs> But, um, you know, different things like, um, you know, the, the coming of Emmanuel, uh, that kind of sign that, um, uh, that uh, the, the, the Savior, the Messiah, is going to come from above, from the Virgin. Um, chapter 9, for unto us a child is born. Um, those kinds of passages. So, overall, we're looking at about 400 different quotations or allusions from Isaiah found in the New Testament. And this is... Um, a book, the book of Isaiah is in the section that we call the prophets. And so from our church history, or sorry, from our Old Testament one class, um, we read a book called Dominion and Dynasty by Stephen Dempster. And this is how he kind of give, gives an account of the prophets. Um, this is what he says. The historical accounts of God's relationship with Israel and its ups and downs uh, but now it gets a glimpse into the inner heart of God to experience his emotional life as revealed through the voice of the prophet. He goes on to say that in the prophets, God bears his heart and it is often a broken one. The covenant was not simply a legal contractual matter, but one that was intensely personal, alive with love, in which the relationship was primary. And so as we delve into this section of the prophets, you're going to find that to be true time and time again, over and over again. And we'll see that you know, in Isaiah as well, that the covenant that God had was, with Israel was not simply a contractual legal matter, but rather it was intensely personal, alive with love, and the relationship was primary.
So going on to slide two, so considering some authorship and compositional issues, uh, there are several guys who, uh, over the course of time, you know, more recently uh, from uh, the Reformation forward, who have uh, tried to uh, say that Isaiah was not one book, there was multiple authors, and uh, those kinds of things. So uh, Doderling um, proposed in 1775 uh, that there was a division in the book. Doom said that there's a third division between chapters 56 and 66, and so ultimately that Isaiah was written by multiple authors in these three different compositions. And so they push this theory forward that there's these multiple authors. And, you know, some of their reasoning for that is that the chronology is off between some of the chapters, and there's possibly some theological differences and uh, difference in language and style. And so some examples of that would be that the first half of the book of Isaiah focuses on the Assyrian king, while the second half focuses on the Babylonian king, um, or, or Babylon in general. Uh, the first half is led by a king or an image of David. Uh, the second half is led by the Levites or the uh, princes. Uh, the first half is about a messianic king. The second half is about a suffering servant. The first half has a lot of historical details, while the second half doesn't have as many details. It's much more forward-looking. Um, and also, Isaiah the person is not mentioned in the second half of the book. So based on some of those things, uh, people think that there are multiple authors in different sections or in at different times and those kinds of things. Uh, but really, there's also strong evidence for a unity of one Isaiah, that there was one prophet Isaiah who wrote all of this. So um, we see that in um, several, several reasons, um, one of those being that the whole book claims to be the work of Isaiah. So um, it opens up with chapter 1, verse 1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. But that claim is also repeated in chapter 7, verse 3, and the Lord said to Isaiah, it's repeated in chapter 20, verse 2, where he says, at that time the Lord spoke by Isaiah to the son, I had said again in chapter 38 and verse 4, Then the uh, word of the Lord came to Isaiah, and then we see it again in chapter 39, verse 5. It says, then Isaiah said Hezekiah. So, um, you know, there's many multiple places where this book is being attested by uh, Isaiah. The Lord spoke to Isaiah. Isaiah said this. Isaiah said this. Uh, modern critical and conservative scholars um, have pointed to the unified content of the book to fit this claim. Example, for example, uh, the Davidic covenant, so the covenant that God made with David, is mentioned in both, uh, both you know the, the front and the last half of the book, um, along with the themes of faith and signs and trust, um, and so those signs and those themes are present throughout the whole book, which again leads credence to this unity that this is one book uh, written by Isaiah. Also, Jewish tradition uh, claims Isaiah is the author. Um, and their support for that uh, belief going all the way back to 150 B.C. So, uh, again, going all the way back to 150 B.C., you can find that kind of support and evidence that Jewish tradition believes that it was one Isaiah. Also, um, there's other phrases and thoughts that occur in this book, which may not seem as important to us, but is really important from a critical literary standpoint uh, because things such as thus saith the Lord or the Holy One of Israel, those are a couple of phrases that you found th that's found throughout the book of Isaiah that's rarely found in other Old Testament books. Um, they occur several times in both the major parts of Isaiah. So again, in the beginning and the latter half, those kinds of phrases are found throughout there. Um, other scholars have noted that um, there's up to 40 or 50 phrases shared in both parts. Again, both parts mean the first half and the second half of the book. And again, that may not seem like a big deal to us, 
but it's really important because again it shows the idea of one author um, you know that there's this consistent theme these consistent consistent phrases used throughout um, and, and not just you know, written here hundreds of years later, written by someone else. You know, there's there's intentionality, it seems. Um, and so, and again, some of these phrases are used in other books as well. Um, also, the book is Palestinian-focused, not Assyrian-focused. Um, and so, the second part of the book would need to keep uh, Assyria's, uh, Assyria in focus, uh, if it was a separate part. Um, also, uh, there aren't any good candidates as to who would have been able to write these kinds of with these kinds of literary abilities. Uh, the, manus the manuscripts uh, were found with the Dead Sea Scroll, support this unity. Um, and so there's, and like I said, there's very few people that we could point to in history that could, we could point to and say, okay, it was actually this person who compiled it. Also, there's an aversion to the fact that Isaiah prophesied the eventual king of Persia uh, 150 years before he lived. So that would be chapters 44 and 45. Uh, you can find some details there. And then also uh, some New Testament authors accept Isaiah as the author. Matthew uh, 3.3, 3, uh, Luke chapter 4, uh, John chapter 12, um, and Romans chapter 10 are several places in the New Testament where those authors accepted this book as being the writing of Isaiah. And so, uh, with all that said, it was most likely written between 740 and 690 BC. Um, and the historical background to the book is found in 2 Kings 15 through 21. Uh, in terms of the audience, uh, the book was written for God's people uh, and going forward. Um, and we know that was for God's people and going forward because there's a strong eschatological tone at the end. Um, when I say eschat eschatological, I'm talking about eschatology, the study of the, the last things. And so um, there's a strong uh, future uh, end times uh, approach and emphasis in this book. Also, um, chapter 2 opens up saying... Um, Chapter 2, verse 2 says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord. And so that phrase, in the latter days, is very key. Because when you see that in the Old Testament, it's always referring to the end times. Um, it's always future in its meaning. It's always looking ahead in the latter days, in the last days. Anything kind of related to that, when you come across that, you need to be thinking, okay, we're in times, okay, future forward thinking here is what we're at. And so uh, that's kind of it in terms of authorship and composition. Uh, like I said, there's a few guys and a few scholars who think that um, ran by different people and by different sections and those kinds of things. But um, I do believe that the unity, uh, the arguments for a united Isaiah written by Isaiah are certainly strong uh, and sufficient to stand on their own ground. Um, and so, uh, moving on to our third slide, we're going to look at some of the themes that we see in this book. So, one of the themes that we see is that of the remnant, the remnant of this uh, faithful group that will survive. Um, so, chapter 1, verse 9 says, if the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So it, again, just describes these few survivors, this remnant. Um, and we also see uh, the idea carried along in uh, chapter 7, verse 3. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son. And so his son's name, Shear Jashub, means a remnant shall return. Chapter 10, we see this presence of a remnant as well. Chapter 10, verses 20 through 21. It says, In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. And so, 
uh, the remnant was faithful while the rest of Israel was not faithful. This remnant, those who are faithful to God, they're going to be the ones to return. They're going to be the ones who survive. Uh, the faithful ones are the remnant. Um, kind of reminds us of the episode of 1 Kings chapter 19, where Elijah's crying out to God, you know, it's only me and all these bell worshipers. And God tells him that, no, there is still some who worship him. And so that should bring you know, encouragement to us to know that we aren't alone. Um, we are alone in the sense that uh, God is always with us, uh, but we aren't alone also in the sense that we have brothers and sisters around the globe in fellow, in, in, in fellow workplaces and similar workplaces and situations that uh, I can almost guarantee you that whatever you're going through, there's someone else in the world going through the same thing that you are and that I'm going through. And so God has said that there is a remnant, that there is a faithful group of his people who will return, who will return to that promised land, to, to, um, to, to be with him and enjoy him forever. So this idea of remnant, again, is found in the book of Isaiah, also the idea of sovereignty. So Isaiah knew that God ruled the whole world and that he would judge the nations. And we see that in chapters 13 through 23. So um, if you look at uh, just starting at chapter 13, you, you'll see that there. Um, most of you will probably have a sub, uh, some kind of heading uh, in your Bible. So right above 13, you see the judgment of Babylon. We see uh, an oracle concerning Moab, Assyria, Philistia uh, in chapters 14 and 15. Egypt, Cush, Damascus in 17, 18, and 19. Uh, Jerusalem, Babylon, uh, Cush. Um, so throughout these, uh, chapter 23 is Tyre and Sidon. Uh, chapter 24, God is judging the whole earth. And so, uh, like I said, Isaiah knew that God ruled the whole world. And he is the judge. He is the judge of the nations. He is the judge of the world. Uh, the whole world is in his control. If it's in the palm of his hand, uh, he, he rules it all. And then also Isaiah chapter 40 through 66 shows that God is sovereign because he sent his people into exile and was able to deliver them. And so that, that's what chapters 40 through 66 is. Is, this, is. is God comforting his people? Um, you know, God telling of the folly of idolatry and God redeeming his people and how he can do that. And, you know, again, it goes back to Israel's sin and disobedience, but then the Lord's coming salvation. And so, um, and so, um, again, that whole idea of uh, that God is the one who is able to save. God is the one who's able to redeem. Not anyone else, only he can. He is the judge and he is the savior and he can do it both well. Uh, thirdly, this idea of uh, servant is uh, very present in this book. So this appears several times throughout this book, this theme. So it could refer to an individual Israelite. We see that in chapter 22. It could refer to Israel itself. We see that in chapter 41. It could refer to the remnant. We see that in chapter 49. And then lastly, it could refer to the Messiah in chapter 52. Again, depending on the context and the situation and and just how it's used, that word, and uh, that word for servant can be used in any of those places. And so, a theme related to servant is that they work to see God, God's purpose, be accomplished regardless of the difficulties. That's the thing about the servant. And that's one thing that we see here is that um, that theme related to being a servant is that it's one who works to see God's purpose be accomplished regardless of the difficulties. And so related to the Messiah in chapter 52, well, that's actually going to be our next slide. We'll talk, discuss that even more, but we know that um, Jesus took on the difficulties. Jesus brought it on. He took it on um, for our sake, for God's sake, to, uh, in, in obedience to the Father. Uh, also, um, the Holy One of Israel is a theme that we see in this book. It's actually used 25 times to describe God. So this phrase is only found six times outside of the book of Isaiah. 
uh, this phrase, the Holy One of Israel, is only found six times um, outside of Isaiah and in the and in the Old Testament. And so um, the theme of holiness is certainly a strong theme, a major theme of God in this book. Um, God says, or Isaiah says that it's God's holiness that changed him. We see that in Isaiah chapter 6. It's a, probably a very familiar passage uh, to most of us uh, when he has this vision of the Lord. And you know, he has this picture of God's holiness. You know, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Um, and then God says, you know, who will go for us? And he says, here I am, send me. So it's in this vision of God's holiness that changes Isaiah. Um, and we also see that, you know, the, the, the people in general, the people of Israel had left the Holy One. We see that in chapter 1, verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. Uh, offspring of evil doers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. And then we see that the Holy One can strike down anyone who challenges his people. And we see that in chapter 37, verse 23. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted uh, your eyes up to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. And so, again, just that you know, notion, the idea that God is the Holy One of Israel so that anyone taunts, tries to attack Israel, come after them, they're actually challenging God himself. He is the Holy One of Israel. And so, again, this theme, the idea, very present, very strong, um, and, you know, it should be impacting us as an impact to Isaiah as well. As we reflect and meditate and think on God's true holiness and all that it is, our life should be changed by that. When we stop and think about how holy God is and how he has called us to live up to that same standard of holiness. So um, lastly, in terms of themes here in the book of Isaiah, we certainly have to have the Messiah. So the Messiah means God's anointed one, um, and he is described here as uh, those who will redeem Israel. Um, uh, with him, there will be a blessing for the whole earth. Um, there will be light to those in darkness. Um, the blessings would come to, chap you know, we see that in chapter 11. Uh, light to those in darkness in chapter 9. Chapter 45 gives the title to uh, Cyrus, but he uh, does not accomplish everything that God's son would do. Um, and then while the Messiah will reign in glory one day, we will first endure suffering. And we see that in chapter 53. And so um, we see, again, this great picture of who this Messiah is going to be, but um, in all his greatness, he's also going to be one who suffers. And so if you look at uh, the fourth slide, there's a chart there that highlights some of the uh, Christology um, that we find in this book. And so Um, and so we see uh, a very strong Christology, again, on slide four, um, within the book of Isaiah. So chapter 52 uh, is where we find that, 52 and 53. Um, so we see a servant, a uh, description of you know, the servant, and then we see how it was fulfilled in Christ. So chapter 52, verse 13, says that he's going to be raised, lifted up, exalted. While Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says that God exalted him and will exalt him in the second coming. 
uh, 52, 14, his appearance is disfigured. Matthew 26, when he received a beating at his trial. Uh, again, 52, sprinkled many nations. Uh, 1 Peter, his sprinkling of his blood brings forgiveness. Uh, 53, he was despised and rejected. Um, John 11 tells us that many rejected him, especially the religious leaders. Uh, chapter 53, he suffered for our sin and was stricken by God. Uh, 1 Corinthians tells us that he died for our sin according to God's plan. Chapter 53, silent before oppressors. Mark 14, silent before his accusers at trial. Uh, chapter 53, killed for the people's sin. Uh, 2 Corinthians, he died for our sin. 53, aside, uh, a grave with the wicked and the rich, but did no wrong. Uh, Mark 15, uh, crucified between two robbers, buried in a rich council member's tomb. Chapter 3, the Lord's will to crush him. Uh, he will see his offspring. Uh, Romans 5, God prepared him as an offering for sin. Chapter 53, reserves great reward because he poured out his life. Uh, Philippians 2 and Hebrews 1, receives great reward because he poured out his life. And so take some time to go through and read through these chapters and the other references and um, just check those out and just, you know, it, it's very striking how Jesus fulfilled all of these things, um, how Jesus fulfilled this whole notion of a suffering servant, um, of a Messiah who will suffer. Then looking at the fifth slide, again, the Christology is huge in the book of Isaiah um, in terms of uh, the Messiah and uh, the Son of God. And so we see several things going on here. Um, we see that um, this Messiah is going to be one who is high and lifted up. That's chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. He's going to be the son of a virgin, according to chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, uh, the Lord will, himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He's going to be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, in chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's going to be the branch of Jesse in chapter 11. Uh, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Again, it's important that it's branch of Jesse because it's coming from David, who is the son of Jesse. He's going to be uh, the comforter in chapter 40, the redeemer and holy one of Israel in 43, and the deliverer in chapter 61. So, um, chapter 6, uh, not chapter 6, slide 6, um, has information on there about um, the virgin uh, and the young maiden. So, our discussion question is, actually going to be based on uh, Isaiah chapter 7 and chapter 36. So what I want you to do for your discussion question is to, um, what, what I would like for you to do is to read chapter 7 and read chapter 36, and I want you to note what is similar about them. Just read them and note in general what's similar and uh, maybe highlight a, a couple of things that are different. And then uh, just tell me your conclusions about why you think those passages were written. So again, read chapter 7, read chapter 36. And again, point out the similarities and differences. And tell me why you think uh, those passages were written. Okay. And then in terms of the virgin versus young maiden. So that's kind of a, been a... Uh, an interpretive issue over time that, you know, people point to that, um, you know, in the Hebrew language, there's a word for virgin, but he used the word for young maiden. So what's going on there? And so uh, to kind of clear that up, 
Um, so and we're looking at chapter 7 for the record. Um, so in this, the Hebrew word for virgin could also be translated as young maiden. So why didn't Isaiah use the specific word for virgin? And honestly, it's because he was doing a wordplay, so we think, which was very common to do a wordplay. And you'll see that in many places in the Old Testament. You know, and such and such was named this because of this. You know, he was named, you know, mourning because it sounds like the word mourning and, you know, those kinds of things. So you see that plenty of times in the Old Testament. So it's very common to do a wordplay. So um, the word from, um, the, the word here that we're talking about is the word um, virgin and the one from above. So uh, chapter 7, verse 10 uh, let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Um, and then also um, down to verse 14, Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And so what's going on there is that uh, he's trying to let us know, cue us into the fact that the child is going to be the one who comes from above. Uh, Matthew used the word for virgin um, when he was quoting this. Um, and so we do know that it is a virgin. And again, the reason he didn't use that word is because of the wordplay. And so when it says that he's going to, the sign is going to come, you know, uh, be as deep as shield or as high as heaven, okay, the sign is going to come from above, okay, that's a wordplay because it's the same letters just ordered differently. Uh, the word for virgin here and the word for above, again, same letters, just different order. And so it's a wordplay is kind of indicating to us, like, well, oh, when we get down there, it's like, ah, oh, okay, it's going to be related to someone coming from above. Um, and also this, again, this word here that's used for him, um, here is almost always translated as virgin. Uh, virgin. There's rare exceptions where this word is not considered virgin in this context. So it's slide seven. Uh, you'll see a little apocalypse. Um, and so, um, again, this book is just so awesome in, in terms of just telling God's story and just seeing um, the story of the gospel, uh, you know, full circle, how, um, you know, chapter, and, and this is found in chapters 24, 25, 26, 27. So um, we see, um, you know, the earth's destruction. Again, chapter 24, God is judging the earth. Uh, chapter 25, we see God's victory over his enemies. You know, God's going to swallow up death forever. We see, um, uh, we see uh, uh, Judah's song of deliverance. So their response is praise. And then we see uh, the coming salvation in chapter 27. And that day, in that day, again, again, looking forward, the Lord with his hand, uh, with his hard and great and strong sword will punish the Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, seeing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it, I keep it night and day. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle, I would march against them. I would burn them up together, or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace to me. And so um, that chapter just, again, concludes with the, the fact that there will be this salvation for Israel. And so, um, you know, again, that's just kind of reminiscent of the little apocalypse, or the big apocalypse that we see in the book of Revelation of, um, you know, this magnolia's final battle where uh, God ultimately wins and judges and um, his people are saved and redeemed. There's also these oracles of woe that's found here. Um, we see oracles of woe against um, uh, against you know, groups of people um, throughout this book, and so uh, we see them um, in chapter five. We see a set of oracles. Um, uh, woe to oppressors to drunkards, to those who test God, uh, to the morally twisted, to the self-exalted, uh, to the immoral opportunists. So in chapter 5, 
that's what you see. Uh, oracles of, o, uh, of woe uh, against all these people who are not like God um, in, in his holiness and his purity. And then chapters 29, 30, 32, and 33, we see oracles of woe against Ephraim, Ariel, foreign alliances. Uh, chapter 32, we do see it mixed with some hope, uh, but we also see woe unto Assyria as well. And so I wanted to point those out again because it supports and undergirds the idea of holiness in this book. Um, not only does it just simply describe how great and wonderful and holy and pure God is, but it also gives us uh, these warnings of, look, this is bad. This is not good. This is not holy. This is not what you want to be about. This is not uh, something that we should endorse. So, um, so, so stay away from that. Um, don't don't be like that. Don't be self-exalting. Don't you know be the one who um, you know sees immorality as an opportunity. Don't oppress people. Don't be drunk. Those kinds of things. Uh, so in the book of Isaiah, that holy one of Israel, who is holy, 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 we see that contrasted against the people who are wicked, wicked, wicked. Um, also, uh, looking at slide nine, um, you see um, uh, an outline there of the book. I uh, do want to draw your attention to the Oracles of the Nations. That's number 10. It's on the second one on the right side of the column. Um, so there is the oracles against the nations. Again, so uh, further uh, naming of each nation, calling them out, uh, judging them. So I just want to point your attention out to there. You see the rest of the outline of the uh, book of Isaiah right there. That's Isaiah 1 through 39. And then 40 through 66. Again, the one that's a little more forward thinking. Uh, in terms of deliverance. So you see the comforter, comfort hope, uh, coming deliverance, the role of God's servant, you know, Israel's redemption, uh, Babylon's judgment, those kinds of things. So that's what we see there. And then the book concludes with the climax of God's restoration. Again, that's chapter 60 through 66. So that is our overview of the book of um, of the book of Isaiah. So, um, like I said, take take some time to read this book over the next week, just to soak in it, rejoice in it, uh, mourn over your own sin, um, pray to God that uh, your life would be changed as you get a bigger picture of His holiness as well. Um, and... Um, I look forward to getting back with you together next week. Again, I apologize uh, for this um, conflict, um, but I hope you all have a great week. And um, feel free, please, to call, text, um, email if you have any questions. Okay, Take care and God bless.